Okay, so today we will do recursion, but before we get started, some students asked uh, about function call signatures for native arrays, so let me just deal with that a little bit. Uh, this is not part of recursion, we'll start recursion once we are done with this. So if you're declaring a two-dimensional native matrix, you can do it as follows, right? Now suppose you're doing that inside main, of course, at this point, m and n need to be defined and known. The values have to be known. So suppose you have declarations like int m, n, and then you read them from c in, then the values will be known at this point, and the compiler can do the necessary memory allocation or generate code for the necessary memory allocation to create that 2D add. Okay. Now, suppose later on inside main, you want to call a function on a. Okay. Suppose you want to turn the function into upper triangular or whatever it is. So here's the issue. So how should you define fun to properly accept A as input? Okay. So technically you cannot even do this in pure C or C++. Um, so I declare fun here. What do I do? I, if I write something like A MN, this is the most natural instinct of anyone who is learning C or C++ for the first time. The problem is, of course, M and N are not in scope. The, the scope has closed here. So at this point, no one knows what M and N are. Okay. Now, if you want to move this declaration outside, if you say int MN, but you read M and N here, even that is a problem because although M and N as variables are known, their values are not known. And remember, when we showed the way in which 2D arrays are allocated in memory in row major order, unless you know the value of N, you don't really know how to address cell number IJ. Okay. So just to find out what the memory offset is for cell number IJ, you need to know the actual value of M, N, if not the first one. So that means that during compilation time, this will again fail. It will claim that n is not a constant. Your only way of succeeding at this is to define this as a constant, but then you can't do that. Okay. So it's really painful to pass around multidimensional arrays or matrices in native form. That's why we move to vector and matrices fairly quickly. Now, in case your n is actually fixed, you don't need to actually you know, declare m. You can keep that empty. Because whenever you're accessing a, i, j, remember the cell value, the cell number, is something like uh, i times n plus j. So as long as it knows n, that's fine. You don't really need to know the first one. If you go beyond it, C++ is happy letting you access garbage memory anyway. So for all these reasons, it's really bad to try to use multidimensional uh, arrays in this kind of things. Okay. One thing you could do is uh, inside, once you declare A, in the symbol table, A actually points to some beginning of a buffer of ints. So A is what is technically called an int pointer. When you discuss pointers, you will see that you can always pass A as int star a. That tells fun that a is a one dimensional array of ints, basically. Okay. Uh, but then you need to send in the row and column information. So you have to say m, n, a. And that's a reasonable compromise. You know the number of rows, you know the number of columns, and you get a handle to the beginning of the buffer. So now you can do your own addressing inside. So now you have to write your own explicit code doing that transformation from row and column to cell number. So you'd have to everywhere, everywhere where you wanted to say a i j, you have to change that into a uh, i times n plus j. You have to write that arithmetic yourself. The system will not do it for you. That's number one. Number two is uh, in terms of return values. or types, uh, whatever you have studied so far, 
uh, is fair game to return in the sense that if you wanted to write vector int fun with some parameter, that's fine. If you wanted to say matrix double return from a fun, that's fine. All of these are okay. Uh, there's one possibly dangerous thing you can start doing at this point, which is pass out a reference. Okay. So suppose you declare something like int and fun. Okay. Suppose you do that. So see where this is going. Suppose I say int y equals x plus 1. return y yeah that means you return an integer reference you don't return an integer you return an address to an integer so this might be a little dangerous because you're allocating a y you're implicitly taking its address and sending it out of the function and then you're destroying the storage for y so you're really asking for trouble here okay so be careful about this pattern in your code this is the simplest way of generating an illegal reference to memory which can be messed up as soon as you return. Okay, okay so that's uh, the preliminary stuff. So today we'll uh, start with recursion. And there's nothing much to it. Uh, most of this segment will be solving interesting problems using recursion. Um, the main point is that a function can call itself, which in turn can call itself and so on. And why can you do that? Because we have uh, figured out in detail how callers and callees manage the space for communication between them, how the caller records in advance where the callee must return. Okay. So if the caller and the callee are actually the same function, it doesn't matter. Okay. You can always nest. Earlier, fun1 called fun2 called fun3, but nothing prevents you from having fun1 call fun1 call fun1. Okay, once you take that leap of faith, you can write many programs much more easily than we have done so far. So look at, for example, that factorial. So I declare a function which takes an int and returns an int. The input is integer n. I want to find the factorial of n. Of n. So I say if n is equal to 0, then return 1. Otherwise, return n into factorial n minus 1. Okay. Very simple piece of code. The first condition ensures that you don't keep on nesting calls indefinitely. Because every call reduces n by 1. If n is positive, we are bound to hit 0 sooner or later. In fact, if the input is 13, then fact will call itself exactly 13 times and then start returning. Okay. So let's uh, look at a quick piece of code to see how that goes. In fact, you can uh, make it look even more nifty. Let me blow up the by using the conditional expressions in C or C++. Okay. So if n is equal to 0, return 1. Otherwise, n times factorial n minus 1. So that's a recursive definition of fac. Okay. And you know there's no point running it. I, I read the n from av1, and then I output fac n. This will run fine. The important thing is let's trace it to see what exactly happens. Okay. So I'm going to. Declare some additional tracing functions, which are not important. So indent uh, will merely insert depth number of spaces in the output stream. Twice depth, actually. So it indents the thing proportionately. And now I'm going to okay, indent uh, n. And then I'm going to print with what input my program was called. Okay. In fact, um, right? So now let's compile this. So what will happen is at the outermost level, suppose I enter 5 as input. FAC is called with 5. So n is 5. I indent 5 levels and print 5. Then I check against 0. It's not 0. So I call 5 times FAC 4. 
the current fact isn't finished, so its activation record remains on stack. And now the activation for fact 4 goes on top of the stack. I come back here, okay, this time I find n to be equal to 4 and so on. So, So 5, factorial 5 calls, factorial 4 calls, factorial 3 calls, factorial 2, etc. Okay. Now we could trace it further by breaking up this nifty one liner by saying if n equal to 0, okay, I'm going to say in, uh, there's no indent anyway. So for 0 it is the base case, otherwise I indent and then I print input, input equal to n and I, okay. then I compute the final output, int output equals n into fact that. Then I finish off, I say, uh, let's, let's put that endl anyway. Okay. For the new line, I'll indent again, and I'll say input equal to, I'll print the input again, output equal to, and then print the new line. So what have I done? I have a method for indenting so many times. In factorial, if it is 0, then that's the base case. Input is 0, I'm returning 1. Otherwise, I indent the line. I say input was n. Then I do the recursive work by calling fact of n minus 1, multiplying it by n. Then I put out another line saying input was this, and the output I'm going to return is the output. Okay. And then finally, I have to uh, return output. And in this case, I have to return So once again, be careful that every arm returns something, otherwise your code will be silently wrong, potentially. So everyone clear with what the code is? It's just a trace code to see how the function is being entered and exited. In the case of zero, it's entered and exited immediately, so I'm printing only one line. In the other case, I print one line on entry, one line on exit from the function with the input parameter in both cases. Okay. So here's the entry point, here's the out exit point. Line 23. Okay. So input 5, it didn't finish anything. It called the routine again with input 4. That called with input 3 until it hit input 0, in which case it returned 1. So now the input 1 guy can finish its work and output 1. After that finishes, the input 2 guy can finish an output 2. Then the input 3 guy finishes with 6, input 4 guy finishes with output 4, and 5 finishes with output 120. Okay. It's clear what's happening. So in pictures, uh, that activation stack business. So here's my stack. I called fac of 5. So this said that after you return, I'm just putting it pictorially, you have to multiply whatever you get by 5 and then return. Okay. Now, and before doing that, it called fac of 4. So that went to another record where it says whatever you get from below, uh, from above, you have to multiply it by 4 before returning. Okay. Then a third entry went there. 
and finally the zero guy did not call anyone else right so so when the zero guy's activation was running it didn't make any other recursive call it directly returned a one from here that was multiplied and a one passed effectively there two passed from here six and so on right so who does all the memory management the stack segment is managed by your runtime system which is attached with the your executable code so the mechanism is the same as managing stacks between any pair of functions calling each other so that's factorial the second example i wanted to show is gcd okay again uh, exceedingly simple the code becomes much much shorter and simpler to read so here is gcd so what is gcd of mn return n is equal to 0 then m otherwise gcd of n and m percent n okay so this assumes that the first argument is larger or at least as large as the second argument so when you take n you you are taking the smaller argument and then m percent n is less than n so the invariant is satisfied okay so whatever you were doing earlier becomes even more readable because i am making a recursive call to gcd here So I could do the tracing just like before. Um, you could say print out So I just trace what I'm doing here. I'll return answer. So the two branches. In one case, I exit with M. The other case, it's the recursive call. Okay. So I could indent as well um, to keep things a little clear. But indenting now has two variables. So let's forget it. Okay. So. So suppose I find the GCD of say three and five, should be one. It says entering GCD three uh, should be five three. Okay, so that has happened automatically. Then you divide and find the remainder. So three two two one one zero. Okay, this is entering all the recursive calls. Finally, because n is zero, exiting GCD one zero with answer one. And then the final return is very simple. Whatever is returned as GCD from a recursive call, the same thing is returned. There is no pending work of multiplying with n as in factorial so this is actually even easier to manage so it just returns the whenever the innermost return returns that's the same value which is percolated entirely outside for example if i say 8 12 then 12 8 8 4 40 and then 4 percolates up to the top okay so it's diving in solving the problem and going out yes Oh, a to i is alphabetical to integer. So if if arg v and arg c, arg v is a bunch of strings. If you want to convert one such string numeral into an int, then you use a to i. A to i takes a string as input and passes an int as output. Fine. So this is how GCD works. And the last example I had for the moment um, is uh, Fibonacci. So you call Fibonacci with int n. If n is less than two, then return one. Otherwise, return fib n minus one plus fib n minus two. That's a sort of formal definition of Fibonacci recursively, and of course, it will run fine. Uh, 
right. So, here is Fibonacci implemented return n less than 2 1 otherwise that. So, again this will work fine, but again let me start tracing what happens. So, I will do this indent code and now I will just separate out those things. If n is less than 2 else ok. So, now I will uh, we will do one thing which is we will just print out the argument with which it is called. So, do not bother about indent ok. So, I will say input n. So, I will do that in any case let us say ok. So, I do not need to case it and I will end all this thing. So, just to record with what argument it was called and then we will just do the same thing. Um, and then finally, I will output the Fibonacci value. Uh, so, let us run this. So, it is a Fibonacci of 0, input 0, 1, Fibonacci of 1, input 1, those are the base cases. Now, I say 2, input is 2, then it recursively calls inputs 1 and 0. Each of them returns a 1, the answer is 2. Now, what if I say 3? 3 calls 2, ok. 2 calls 1 and 0 and 1. Two, 3 calls 2 and 1, ok. So, let me print the following. So, one way to understand uh, recursion is also to attach a level which you can use to indent, ok. So, I am trying to compute Fibonacci at a particular level called level and I am making recursive calls at level plus 1. This is a very easy way to test what recursion is actually doing for you. Okay. So, I just added an argument which is the nesting level of the call on the stack okay. and I initialize it to 0. So, I am starting the call at base level of the stack. Anytime I am trying to push something onto the stack, I am counting how many activation records have gone on the stack. Okay. So, is the trick of the level clear to you? So, I am just trying to track how many things are there on the stack on my own without any help from the system. And now, I am going to you know I am going to indent to level. So, that things are shifted properly fine. With this modification, if I recompile the code, the printout is much more understandable. So, if I do say 5, so, see what happens here. Uh, I called Fibonacci with input 5, that resulted in two recursive calls input 4 and input 3 at the same level. Input 3 resulted in recursive calls at input 2 and input 1. Input 2 resulted in recursive calls at numbers 1 and 0, which returned immediately without further recursion. Okay. So, you see the pattern here. If I took another one, so, 6 does 5 and 4 at the basic level. So, it is a tree structure because each Fibonacci calls two Fibonacci's. So, it is a binary tree fine, where the leaves are always 1's and 0's. 1's and 0's do not go any further. So, it is not a balanced tree, but it is a binary tree. Okay. So, now let me switch off the indent so just so that we can just get a listing of how often Fibonacci was called with each number. So, if I compile this again and with 6 and I less it, I just get this without the indent. So, it is not clear what is happening, but I can always sort it the lines and then I get this. So, 13 ignore the 13. In fact, I can I should switch off the 13. You can even grep for input. So, only the input lines come in. Grep is something that matches for a pattern. Okay. So, now you see that there are all these all the calls to Fibonacci with various inputs sorted by the input value. Okay. Now, uh, how many do we have of each call? So, as you can see input 0 was called many times, input 1 was called many times. Okay. How many times was in input called? You can do that 
by a command called unique dash c. So take unique lines and count them up. And now you see that input 0 was called 5 times, input 1 was called 8 times, input 2 was called 5 times, and so on. Okay. So I'll switch to a different screen next with input 5, I think. So let me show that one. Okay. So if the input is 5, then remember this. 5 is called once. Okay. Sorry, uh, 5 is called once. 4 is called once but 3 is called twice, 2 is called 3 times, 1 is called 5 times, 0 is called thrice. Why is that? So let's look at this chart to figure out why. This actually is 7, even better. Um, so let me actually do 7 so we can match the counts. So with 7, Fibonacci is called with input 7 once, with input 6 once, with input 5 twice, with input 1 13 times, with input 0 8 times. Why does that happen? Because of this picture. So let me materialize the whole thing. You call Fibonacci with 7, that results in recursive calls with input 6 and 5. 6 results in 5 and 4. Okay? So if you count up the number of leaves with value 0, that will match the count given by the program. If you count up the number of leaves with value 1, that will match the number of calls with value 1 as printed by the program. Okay. Now you see why this is happening. Because there, are, there is too much repeated work going on here. So if I call it with 5 already in that subtree, you see that every time you know, the call with Fibonacci 2 already happens thrice. This entire tree of computation returns the same thing over and over again. And still it is actually called thrice, I pay the cost of calling it thrice, each time it does the recursion, each time the leaves 1 and 0 return with value 1, Fibonacci 2 will add them up to get 2 and pass it up to the top. Not only that, even the call with 3 is replicated twice in this subtree already. Okay. And now when 6 is expanded, that entire 5 subtree is again copied okay, here, and the entire 4 subtree is now copied thrice over. Okay, so the moral of the story is just because you can write Fibonacci recursively, you shouldn't. Because the number of subproblems we are solving here grows exponentially. Whereas as we well know, by using just three memory cells, you can compute Fibonacci in linear time. Okay. So recursion is a very good hammer, but that doesn't mean that all problems are nails. So recursion may result in unnecessary complication in your code. Every call has an overhead. And so this is an ideal situation where I'm solving the same subproblem over and over again an exponential number of times, which was entirely unnecessary. Why could I save time and effort in Fibonacci? Because as you move up in a web front from the bottom levels of the tree to the upper levels, you can entirely forget the bottom levels for one thing. And the second is that you could really store the value of fib4 in one place and read it here, there, and here. Why did I have to recompute the whole tree again and again? I could have cached the answer. So these two observations that values older than n-2 are not required, and that anytime I need this in the recursive definition, I can read it from one place. That makes it easier to write Fibonacci in linear time instead of exponential time, as would happen if you ran the recursive code. So offline, what you should do is, that you should compile the standard Fibonacci recursive code and you should run it with increasing input arguments so that it actually does this exponential business and measure the time and do a quick plot of as you increase n, how much time does Fibonacci recursive take to return? You'll find it grows exponentially. Whereas quite obviously from the iterative scheme, Fibonacci of n will take order n time. Okay. So that's an important uh, lesson that recursion should be used uh, quite sparingly, when you think the setting is quite right. Okay. But recursion can often be a very good thinking tool, and it's sometimes even a very good implementation tool. For example, uh, the last time we implemented mod sort, okay, so it was early on in the semester, and we are not too conversant with 1D vectors and indexing yet. So we had to assume that the array was of length, which is a power of 2. And we had to carefully chunk it up into 
blocks, each of which was a power of two size. Then we had to build this merging tree, binary tree. And we had to do the index arithmetic quite correct so that the correct segments were being merged and so on. All that becomes hugely easy to represent if we start writing merge sort recursively. And in this particular case, no efficiency is lost. So this is a good application of writing recursive code. So suppose I'm, I have to write a recursive sort function, which is merge sort, where the input vector is a vector of ints, vec, and to generalize it, I say that I have to sort it from low to high. This is the index counterpart of what standard C++ wants you to do, sort from begin to end. So the first call will happen between 0 and vec dot size minus 1. What do I do inside? If high minus low is less than or equal to 1, then the array is the segment I am told to sort is either empty or it's one element. So I return immediately. There's nothing to do if I'm told to sort low to high in the vector and low, low, high minus low is less than or equal to 1. Otherwise, I pick a midpoint, which is low, low plus high divided by 2. Now observe that here I do not need to assume that vector has a size which is a power of 2 or anything. If mid is slightly to the left or right of the exact midpoint, it's fine. It doesn't matter to me. Why? Because in the first recursive call, I'm going to sort vector between low and mid the convention is that low is included and high is excluded, just like most indexing schemes of C++. Okay. So I find mid, I sort between low and mid minus 1, both inclusive, or mid in, low inclusive, mid exclusive. Then I again call sort, this is similar to the Fibonacci recursive call. I again sort the vector from mid inclusive to high exclusive. Finally, I create a temporary vector, which is initially empty. And then I merge two segments of vec. See, once sort vec returns, you can assume that low to mid minus 1 is sorted and mid to high minus 1 is sorted. So I call a merge routine, which takes vec and two segments, low to mid minus 1 and then vec, mid to high minus 1. And so think of the first three arguments as providing a range in one vector and the second three arguments providing a range in another vector. They just happen to be the same vector. I will merge those using the standard merge routine I have defined and write them in temp. Okay. See, once I do this, it's clear that I can now copy back temp, which is entirely sorted, into vec between low and high. And that finishes my contract. The contract of sort is given any vector and low and high, when I output, low to high minus 1 has to be sorted in the vector. I do that by invoking the contract recursively. I make the same routine sort low to mid minus 1 and mid to high minus 1. Then I merge them and write them out to low to high minus 1. Okay. So the complicated index arithmetic is entirely gone. This starts looking almost like binary search with the exception that there are two recursive calls. To sort the left half, sort the right half. Approximate half is fine. Mid going off by 1 either way is fine. That doesn't bother us anymore. So let's look at the code in action, including tracing code, which I've already written. So here is recursive mod sort. Okay. So indent is again, prints out indents to clarify what level the recursion is happening at. Print is just a print routine. So the first thing to look at is copy. So copy takes an input vector and an output vector and a low index. The low applies to the out vector only. So I copy the entire in vector from 0 to in dot size to out low through low plus in dot size minus 1. Okay. So to keep a picture on screen, if this is in and that is out, if I say start copying here, then uh, This is replaced by the content here. That's what copy does. Okay. Now, what does merge do? Merge we have already seen. Uh, in fact, because uh, both my arrays are the same, I'm not passing in twice. Okay. And by the way, you can always declare this to be const because you are not changing in. Okay. Merge we can also declare as const. 
from low one to high one in the same from the same in array take the ranges low one to high one and low two to high two those are effectively two different arrays now merge them and write them out to out okay out is set to empty to start with and then the cursors are set to low one and low two r1 and rx1 and rx2 with will walk through the two segments okay and while rx is less than uh, high one and rx2 is less than high two i do the comparison and to out i push back whichever is smaller very simple code this is just merging as you have always seen and then while one of the arrays survives you keep exhausting it and pushing it back to the output okay so how many people are comfortable with the merge routine it's a standard merge it's just that i am reading the same array in in two ranges it's only the index here which change rx1 plus plus rx2 plus plus so pictorially uh, the merge routine looks like this so here is in the first argument and then uh, what are the parameters low one and high one so here is low one and let's say here is high one and let's say here is low two there is high two and my goal is to take low one inclusive to high one exclusive low two inclusive to low uh, high two exclusive and take these two things two ranges and merge them okay and write the output vector output is initialized to empty and finally its size is the sum of these two sizes okay. that's what merge does so finally merge sort the recursive routine is extremely easy to write if high minus low is less than equal to 1 indent depth and write that it's already sorted and i print that sorted vector between low and high okay and return there's nothing to do otherwise i indent depth i print that i have to sort the segment from low to high then i pick the mid i call merge sort itself recursively between low and mid and between mid and high as i did in the slide then i create the temporary vector i do the merge of vec from low to mid and mid to high and write into temp finally i copy temp back to vector at low okay fine and i indent depth and i say what i merge to so the result of the merging i print the vector now between low and high again fine so in main i just create a vector of names as before and then i call merge sort between 0 and names dot size that's the first level call okay so everyone comfortable with this so basically you know it, apart from the tracing code all i had to write is a merge code and a copy code and then the definition of merge sort itself was really short i mean i put in tracing code which made it longer but it's actually quite very very simple the code is really as simple as this so if i run this now okay to sort the original array zebra alligator giraffe wolf lynx jackalope that results in two recursive calls this one and that one the first one goes from zebra to giraffe half the array the second one wants to sort wolf to jackalope wolf to jackalope okay let's focus on the first sub tree here okay so i split it down the middle but because there is an odd number of elements the left one contains only zebra and because it has only one element it's already sorted then i have to sort alligator and giraffe that recurses into sorting alligator and sorting giraffe in two different segments those are already sorted again because they are base cases only one element then i merge alligator and giraffe as two different arrays into alligator and giraffe okay now what do i have i have zebra already sorted i have alligator giraffe already sorted when i merge those i have alligator giraffe and zebra on the other 
top level branch I wanted to sort wolf, lynx and jackalope. So again I do a cut, I find one element on one side and two on the other. Wolf is already sorted being a single element. Now I have to sort lynx and jackalope, decompose into sorting lynx and sorting jackalope, already sorted one element. I merge to jackalope comma lynx and then that merges with wolf to jackalope, lynx and wolf. So at this point I have alligator, giraffe, zebra and jackalope, lynx, wolf. When I merge them, remember each of them is sorted now. I merge to alligator, giraffe, jackalope to zebra. Okay. So it's the same merge sort except that I don't need to do that messy index arithmetic. I just split it in the middle, it may be off, doesn't matter. I do recursive calls. I get each of the sub arrays sorted, then I merge the two and write it back in place. So how many people are comfortable with uh, this stuff? Good? Okay. Now once we have the power of recursion, uh, we can actually write another very nice uh, sorting routine called quick sort, which some of you may have heard of. So suppose we have this array to sort 51926. In quick sort, the first step is to pick what's called a pivot element. And the pivot could be any of those elements. So let's arbitrarily pick the first guy as pivot. So choose an arbitrary element as what's called a pivot, mark it yellow, five. Okay. The next job is to what's called sift. Okay, so you shake the array and sift it so that all elements less than five go to the left of 5, all elements larger than 5 go to the right of 5. But within those we don't bother to sort yet. In other words, elements less than 5 were 1 and 2 and they happen to be already in sorted order so that's fine, we don't disturb that. Elements larger than 5 were 9 and 6 in wrong order. We don't bother, we actually keep them in the same order, 9 and 6. All we have done now is Similar to mod sort, we have created a split. One middle element and the left which is less and the right which is more. Okay. So that's the mapping and note that the other elements are not necessarily sorted among themselves. The only guarantee is that the left, every element on the left is less than 5, every element on the right is greater than 5. Now the problem naturally decomposes because I can say whatever be the left segment, just sort it. Whatever be the right element, just sort it. The left element is already sorted in this case. The right element is sorted to 6 and 9 and that gives you the sorted overall array. Okay. So this is sort of the opposite order of thinking as mod sort. Mod sort first does the recursive calls to make sure that the two sub arrays are sorted and then merges them. This guy just splits it up into the lowers and the highers and then does the recursive calls to finish up. So the only issue is, can I do this sifting about as efficiently as merging? If I can do that, then the algorithm will still be as efficient as mod sort. Right? Okay. So let's look at quick sort code. That sift routine is slightly tricky, but uh, it's not too bad. Okay. So instead of looking at the pieces, let's look at the sort routine. So sort looks exactly the same as before. Vec between low and high, I'm going to sort. If high minus low is less than or equal to 1, that's a trivial array. I'm already done, I return. Okay. Otherwise, I will uh, print out the range just for tracing between low and high that I'm supposed to sort. Okay. I print out the whole vector. This, uh, this is older code, but you can plug in the other code to make it print better things. And then I find the pivot. I'm just arbitrarily picking the pivot as the first element, Vec of low. You can pick anything you want. And then I find mid. Okay, what, mid is the result of sifting the array on pivot. Okay. I will discuss what sift looks like exactly in a moment. Then I sort the left half, then I print the second, I sort the right half. Note that mid is excluded explicitly here. So compared to mod sort, it's slightly different in that I sort from low to mid minus 1, but not mid to high minus 1, mid plus 1 to high minus 1, because the pivot is already done. It's in the correct position. Okay. So sort itself should be fairly clear provided we understand what sift really does. Okay. So sift returns mid in the sense that I picked some arbitrary value in this thing. I want to find out what the position was. 
so mid will be in this case 2 because 5 moves to position 2. So the job of the shift routine is to place 5 so that all the smaller elements come to the left and all the larger elements go to the right and report where 5 landed up so that I can do the recursive calls with the correct range indices. Okay. So, so shift tells me where VEC of low landed up and I use that mid to create the recursive calls here. Fine. So let us uh, see how this works. In particular, SIFT is the most complicated thing here. So what does SIFT do? See, SIFT is passed three arguments. It is passed the vector with the range that is involved, low to high minus 1. The third argument is the pivot index. Okay. The pivot index in particular is always being called with low, but that is just happenstance. Okay. In low, you could choose anything between low and high minus 1 and pass it as the third argument. The algorithm would be correct nevertheless. Instead of low, I could put high minus 1 and the algorithm would be perfectly right. You could put in anything between low and high minus 1 as the third argument. Okay. So let us return to low. And now what does SIFT do? Okay. This is a little messy. Okay. So see, finding out the correct position of the pivot element is easy. I just have to count how many elements were less than the pivot. But during the move, I have to make sure that I am not copying things too many times, that I am moving it in one shot. So the way we do it is as follows. First, I swap the pivot with the highest thing. Okay. Let me uh, keep going with that example I have here. Okay, five one nine two six. It's good to do on the board so that all of them remain on in your view at the same time. Five uh, one nine two six. And this is my pivot element. Okay. So px is 0 to start with. So here is the code. So the very first thing you do is swap vec px with high minus 1. So what happens here? High minus 1 is 6. The value is 6. So it, it goes 6, 1, 9, 2, 5. Okay. That is the first step that happens. Now, I set a right cursor to low, wx. And now for a read cursor going from low to high minus 1, high minus 2 actually, rx less than high minus 1. So rx less than equal to high minus 2. So the read cursor can only go up to this point. Okay. What do I do? If vec of rx is less than vec of high minus 1. Remember high minus 1 now has the pivot. Okay, so henceforth this is where the pivot element has landed up. Okay. If what I am reading at rx is less than the pivot, then I swap rx with wx. Initially they are the same. Okay. And then I increase the right cursor. So think of, you know, whenever you see a right cursor in such use, think of a new array that you are starting out. Fine. I am just reading from the first to everything up to and excluding the pivot itself. Anything that is less than pivot, I am appending to the new buffer in the same order. I am not bothering to sort. Okay. And at the end of it, uh, I am just swapping the pivot with the read cursor, right cursor. Remember at the end of it, the right cursor will exactly be the number of items less than the pivot. So I just push the pivot to the end of it. And by magic, everything that's larger have moved to the right. Okay, let's trace this and you'll see that happen. So in the first step, Rx and Wx are both zero. And the condition is not satisfied. So nothing happens. Only Rx always advances because it's part of the for loop. Wx doesn't advance unless you actually append something here. So after the first step, the array remains the same. Rx advances to this position. 
Okay. At this point, vec Rx is less than the pivot. Okay. And what happens is that uh, I swap Rx with Wx. So the, the array becomes 1, 6, 9, 2, 5. Wx advances because I did do some writing and Rx advances here. In the next step, vec Rx is 9, vec i minus 1, which is the pivot, is 5. So I do nothing. Rx advances again. Okay. Okay. So this time 2 is less than 5, and so I do a swap between Wx and Rx. Okay. So the array becomes 1, 2, 9, 6, 5, and I'm done because Rx has bumped into the right limit of high minus 2. And the final step switches, so remember what Wx is. Wx is advanced 1 to this one. Okay. And at this point I swap high minus 1, which is the pivot, with Wx. Okay. So this becomes 1, 2, 5. 6, 9. So in this case, it turns out to be sorted, but it doesn't need to be in general. You are free to change it. You don't, you don't need to guarantee that it's that the left and right half are sorted. Okay. Fine. So the pivot lands up here. This is less than pivot. That is greater than pivot. That's all we guarantee. So the only tricky part here to understand is that by first pushing off the vector to the right and then you know, swapping as I'm doing, that everything higher than the pivot automatically percolates to the right. But after looking at the code for a couple of examples, you'll figure it out easily. Okay. So that's the shift routine. Clearly the shift routine takes linear time. Okay. So this is a situation of input dependent complexity in the sense that Suppose uh, the time to sort n things, I want to write this as the time to shift plus the time to sort the left plus the time to sort the right. Well, everything depends on where the pivot landed up. I don't know where the pivot was, so it's value dependent. Unlike mod sort, where we purposefully chopped it up into halves. So you know exactly what the time was. So analyzing this is a little more complicated. Uh, one way to analyze it, okay, so for example, the worst case time for quick sort is n squared. What if the array given to you is already sorted and you kept picking the leftmost element as pivot? You're only getting rid of one element at a time. So you can verify that your time will be n squared. But there is a way to ensure that quick sort is quick. And that's why it's called quick sort which is that you pick a random pivot. You actually choose one of the elements in the current range at random. In that case, it's easy to show, or not too difficult to show that the expected time is order n log n, just like mod sort. Okay. And the advantage of quick sort is that you don't need an additional buffer, like mod sort. We are doing the shifting in place. Okay. Fine. Any questions about quick sort? So it's the opposite of mod sort in a way of thinking because in mod sort you first merge the two sub lists and then you merged it. Here you first split up the original list, sifted it, and then recursively sorted the two remaining parts. The smaller part and the larger part. So the printout is not as friendly as the earlier one. So here it is. I have to sort the initial array zebra, alligator, giraffe, wolf, lynx, jackalope. And I'm told to sort it from 0 to 6. 0 inclusive, 6 exclusive. The pivot is zebra, the first one. Okay. And now, um, the pivot being zebra, that will go to the end. 
So one of the halves becomes Jacquelot through links 0 to 5, so called halves, it is not really half. Okay. Now the input is jackalope through links actually, the pivot becomes the first one jackalope. Okay. And now um, the result is that I have alligator giraff percolating to the left of jackalope and wolf and links to the right of jackalope. Observe that wolf and links were unsorted, they remain unsorted on the right side of the pivot. Okay. Zebra is already in position, zebra is the pivot, it has gone to its correct position. So the, so the subarray I have to focus on is jackalope, alligator, giraffe, wolf, lynx and jackalope is the first element which becomes the pivot, moves to the third or sec, twoth position, alligator and giraffe shift to the left, wolf and lynx remain on the right, unsorted. In the next call I have to recursively sort alligator and giraffe, 0 to 2 exclusive. The pivot is alligator, it stays where it is, giraffe is a trivial thing, so all that is sorted. Meanwhile sorting 3 to 5 exclusive, which is wolf and lynx, okay, makes it lynx and wolf. Okay, so, so the first thing that happens is the first pivot zebra find its correct position. The second thing that happens is the second pivot jackalope find its correct final position. Alligator finds its final position, so it happens in the pivots. The pivots find their correct position and then the other things are recursively adjusted around them. Okay. Now I do not have preparation for the network, but there are very excellent Java applets which show you comparatively how mod sort and quick sort work on a bunch of keys. Okay, they are beautiful graphic applets. I will see if I can link you to that in Moodle, but you can just do Google search saying sort applet demo or something like that. You can see how these values keep percolating, okay. it is very, very nice to see those. Okay, so that, uh, that is quick sort for us. Okay, any questions about recursive sorts? So earlier we looked at selection sort which was kind of silly, then we looked at mod sort where you had to do some index arithmetic. Now all that burden is taken away because you can write these things recursively. So the last problem we will look at today, uh, will start but probably not entirely finish, is string edit distance. Okay. Now so what do I mean by that? You want to find out how similar two strings are. Like you want to find how similar are the two strings kitten and sitting. Okay. And you express that as, okay, someone replace the k by an s and that became sitten, which is a meaningless word. Then the e became an i, that was sitten, and then you appended a g and that made it sitting. Okay. Why is it useful to talk about string edit distances? I will give you a whole bunch of applications. Um, nowadays, many envelopes that are addressed with printed addresses on the top, they go through optical character recognition software for automatic routing in big post offices at the metro level. Okay. So the OCR can make some mistakes because the label was not quite stuck on a right angle or there is a smudge of ink somewhere. Okay. What you want to do is to find the nearest matching city name or town name or street name. Okay, you want to find the, an actual address in the post office's address book which is closest in terms of edit distance. Fine. Another example is where um, you are trying to judge if one web page was a copy of another one, so that you do not index it twice in your index. Okay. Very often what happens is, you, you know, someone can take a whole site and mirror it. Okay. Or you copy someone's page and say I really like this and I did not want to leave it at their site because that can go away, I just made a local copy so I can always see it. And sometimes you are honest, you can write at the bottom that you know this was last modified by yourself. So your page will have a small difference from the earlier page. Okay. So to detect whether these two pages are very similar, you might want to do a string edit distance. Okay. Uh, gene research is another important place where string edit distance is very important. So some of you may know that genomes can be expressed as strings of four characters, A, C, G and T. And then whether an enzyme docks with a gene at the proper site or not really depends on string matching. 
So large molecules are actually distilled into a few characters. And the pattern of characters decides whether the enzyme in a particular drug or maybe a virus can dock onto a particular point in your genome and damage it or fix it. Okay. So to do that, you need to find out edit distances between two genomes or a genome's molecule sequence and a drug's molecule sequence to decide if they can dock. So string matching and string edit distance is very, very important in many areas of computing with other applications. So coming back to this example, if I had to tell someone what to do to edit kitten to sitting, I would give the following instruction. Replace K with S. And in case there are multiple Ks in the string, I have to say which one, of course. Then replace E with I and then append a G. So there are three operations. Now, in case of, say, optical character recognition for the post office, all edits don't have the same cost. It's fairly easy to confuse reading a 7 for a 1, depending on how you write it, or an 8 for a 3. It's much more rare for an 8 to be mistook for a 1. Okay. So when I say replace E with I, the cost of that may be quite different from replacing Q with G. So in general, we may have a matrix which gives you the cost of mistaking one character for another one. But in this simple example, I'll assume that the cost of any such operation is exactly one unit. And when I say I'm looking for the minimum cost edit, I mean give me an edit transforming one string to the other with the minimum number of operations. Just count the number of operations to turn one string into another. So how do I do this? Now, clearly, you know, I can't do an exhaustive search because there are too many characters that I can insert at too many positions. So I need to do this a little smartly. Okay. So I, I set up the two input strings as two arrays. Okay. And for once, I'll use a one base because that will make life a little easier for us. So the string S, which is kitten, is goes from k in position 1 to n in position 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay. And similarly, t is sitting. So the source and the target. The two extreme points are s and t. And we define d of ij to be the smallest edit distance or the smallest number of operations in this case that can convert s to t. So dij returns an integer. dij is a function which can read s and t Okay. And dij is defined as the smallest edit distance between not s and t as a whole, but prefixes of s and t. So I'll build up my solution gradually. Just like I was building up Fibonacci of n, or I was building up recursive merge sort. Okay. So dij is the smallest edit distance between the prefix of s from 1 to i and t from 1 to j. Okay. Now what are the base cases? Suppose I start with the second string being empty. Okay? So if dij, if j is equal to 0, it means that my target string is empty. And di means I have to start from s1 and go up to i. Now suppose I take d of 1, 0. What does it mean? It says take the string k alone and turn it into an empty string. What is the cost? I have to delete k. Right? So, so here is s, here is t, let's say. So dij is the number of edits you need to do on this segment to turn it into that segment. Okay. Actually, in this case, i is included because I'm not doing a zero base thing. So naturally, my final answer will be d of mn. That's my eventual answer. Okay. So how do I define various things? So suppose I say d of uh, i zero. Now, if j is equal to 0, that means t is actually empty. t is the empty string of length 0. Okay. If I want to transform 
any d of i0 to an empty string. Okay, so for example, if i is equal to 1, then I just have k here. That's it. To turn k into an empty string, I have to delete k. To turn k i to an empty string, I have to delete two characters. So the cost is 2, and so on. That's the reason why d i0 is equal to i. You give me i characters from s to get rid of all of them, I'll need that cost i. Similarly, d0j is equal to j because I start with an empty string and I have to turn it into a length j string by appending each of those characters. Fine? So those boundary conditions are clear. In particular, d00 is equal to 0. To turn an empty string into an empty string, you don't need to do anything. The cost is 0. Fine? So those are the base cases of the recursion. And then the recursion does one of four things. So I'm trying to uh, transform the string from S1 through SI to the string T1 through Tj and j not doesn't need to be equal to i. j could be here. But suppose I find that the last two characters are the same. Okay. So if I'm trying to transform s1 through i to t1 through j and si is equal to tj, that's the first case. Then that last place is already matched. There's no cost for it. And I'll have to just recursively match the prefixes. So the call now says that I just have to match this guy with that guy and I'm done. That's the first line. So dij is equal to just di minus 1, j minus 1 in the fortunate case that the last characters are the same. Fine. What's the second situation? You may choose to delete the uh, last character of one of them which means an insertion for the other one. Okay. So for example, the second line says that um, those two characters are not equal. And I think I should uh, delete i. Okay. If I ground out i, then I do a recursive call on the remainder with the same on j. I still have to account for that last character here. I just paid cost 1 by deleting that last character from the first string, from s itself. So I say I'm going to incur a cost of 1 for deleting si. And then the remaining cost is di minus 1 j. Conversely, I may decide to ground this guy paying a cost of 1 plus 1. And then my recursive call will be on the whole of i and the prefix on so j minus 1. That's the third line, di and j minus 1. Okay. The only remaining possibility is that those two characters are not the same. And I have to transform one to the other, paying a cost of 1. Like transform a 3 to a 8, or transform a 1 to an l, something like that. So currently, that cost is always uniform. That's the plus one. If I decide that I'm going to edit or replace this character with this character, then the recursion happens on minus one and minus one. So it's d i minus one, j minus one. Fine. So there are only these four cases. Nothing else could happen. If I have to find the edit cost of s1 through i to t1 through j, you depend on what happened in the last position, and accordingly, you recurse on the previous ones. Okay, so how many people are comfortable with this definition? Just the definition. Okay, yes? So there's no, nothing else that could happen, right? Dij can be expressed as the minimum of those. And we want it to be minimum. We want to take the best possible option to minimize the overall edit cost. Right? So suppose we write this up. Um, before writing up, maybe we can look at a couple of examples. Yeah. So this kitten and sitting example. If you used those rules that we set out in the previous 
um, slide. And then because the base cases can be computed right away, so the first thing you do is fill out the 0th row and 0th column. Okay. Remember we said that di0 is i and d0j is j. Okay. And now we start filling things out from this corner toward the bottom. Okay. See the recursion always refers to either the previous row or the previous column or both. So the right way to fill up would be say row wise or column wise after you are done with the boundaries. Okay. So if I fill up this table then S and K, all right, you'll see that it's a it's a question of replacement. Okay. So you don't want to do a delete followed by an insert because that's a cost of two. You'd rather do a single replacement of S to K that will give you a cost of one. So at this cell, what you'll compare, you'll choose one of four options. Okay. One is substitution or replacement, which will cost you one. See so the last characters are not the same, right? S and K. So the first doesn't apply. You have to choose between those three options. Okay. So you either, you know, if you say that I'm going to delete one of them and then add the other, that will be a cost of two. Whereas if you choose the third option, replacement, and then it will be just zero plus one. That's the one you will take in this case. Now, in the second place, i is equal to i. So there is no cost in the sense that I'm taking now the very first clause. Okay. And so this value is just one plus zero. Okay. I mean, I, I could be a little foolish and say that, well, it it's happens by first substituting s by k and then appending i and then deleting i, but why would you do that? It's the same thing, so I'll take the minimum path. So anyway, all you have to do is to just blindly apply these rules, which you hopefully trust by now. Compute the cell, and you can also remember which of these four cases led to the minimum. Suppose you also recorded that in the cells, then you could trace back this path. So you would actually remember that this minimum was achieved because of substitution of k with s. That was achieved by doing nothing because i and i matched up, t and t matched up. So you go right down here until I end up with n, which also matches. Okay. So up to n, um, the cost is 2. Why is that? Because of this one substitution of i with e here, that's one of the increases. And the other increase is substitution of k with s here. 0 increase to 1, 1 increase to 2. That's how we ended up with a match between kitten and sitin. And to get the g, you have to append it. That's another cost of 1. That's the last cost. So the edit distance in this case is 3, okay, which is exactly the same as the number of operations I specified here. Okay. So next time, we'll write a recursive routine for this. And we'll see that this is another of these cases where recursion is a very bad idea. Because these recursive calls are made to a row above and a column before, and they keep on proliferating through the lattice. So any particular cell will be touched many, many times. It's much better to create a table and actually store these values in a table form, sort of like if you had an array for Fibonacci. Suppose you don't want to be too smart, you can always, to compute Fibonacci of n, you could always retain the whole history of Fibonacci 0 through n minus 1. That will also give you linear time, it just takes a little more space. In this case, the space turns out to be mandatory because you could touch the lower parts of the array at any time. Okay. So we will first of all write a recursive routine for this. We'll see that it's very inefficient. Small examples will still terminate, but you'll basically describe all possible paths from this corner into the leftmost corner. You'll traverse all those paths many, many times, touching every cell again and again. So instead, we'll actually cache the results, just like you can cache the results of Fibonacci in a 1D array. So that we'll start populating the array from the upward and left border, and we'll fill this out. We'll remember how each minimum came about, so that we can issue the exact edit operations that are required to transform one to the other. So here's another example of transforming Saturday into Sunday. 
you can again work out the numbers by hand, you'll see that we start with empty editing to empty with no cost. No cost here, same thing. A and U, you need a replacement. Okay. Um, and then you can, you can trace it out. Okay. So U and U, you have to insert A, T. Okay. U and U match. Okay. So this is insertion of A and T, not, not editing A to U. I insert A and T, U and U is the same. R edits to N, D and D are the same, no increase. Okay. Uh, a and A are the same and Y and Y are the same. So again, this is edit distance three, but the pattern is a little different. So we'll stop here and next time we'll do the code for edit distances.